So we're going to talk about supercharging your Xamarin application. So hi, my name's Chris Briggs. I'm a senior software dev at SW, and I really head up its sort of IoT push. So first up, we're going to thank our sponsors. So uh, UNSW for this room, SSW for recording and pizza, and Dev Express for coffees. Now, if you want these slides, just text this to the number, and like Gerard said, a message will be sent to you with a link. So we're going to cover three main points today, and we're going to start off with talking about transient exceptions, we're going to move into persisting data, and then talking about asynchronous error handling. But those three things seem really disparate. So let's talk about the stages of an app, just to get an idea where this all fits. So apps, where they start off as just an idea. You've thought of a problem you're trying to solve, you think anything is possible, and public enemy number one is scope creep. And then we manage to make the proof of concept. We build it, the core functionality is working, it's very buggy, and we're still fleshing the application out. At this point, we think we're ready to go. We think we're ready to move into beta testing, and we've really only tested the application in our own dev environment, in our own dev space, which normally has really good Wi-Fi or on a simulator that has no networking kind of issues. So we think, awesome, time to go out there. And I've seen this happen a number of times. The application that works great in the lab falls over horribly in the beta testing phases. So we start gathering data, we start listening to feedback. We realize, well, the application is really fragile. And that's where everything we're talking about comes in today. We're going to talk about the libraries you can use to add the robustness to your app, to supercharge it, so that if you put in stage one, when you go to beta testing, you're gathering useful feedback. Because improving the application, if someone says to you, it crashed, and it only just crashed because we lost internet connection, that's not really useful. But if someone says to you, it crashed because I got some weird error in the, that popped up about business logic, then we know we have things that we can really fix. So then we get the, so then moving a little on, what happens a little bit after that is we, we set it loose, we're releasing it into the app store, we continue to gather data, we're listening to our users' feedback, especially through the, their store reviews, and we're continuing to improve the app. At this point, it's market validation, it's all sink or swim, and we realize that if the application survives, we're going to get to this point here. So it's the stage four, we've got data, and basically, the app's been out for a while, and we've instrumented it so we have the tools to let us know what parts of the application are being used, to see our exceptions happening in real time. And effectively, we get to this point where we can say, feature X is not a key feature, but it's used 75% of the time by users, so therefore, we should really invest a few sprints into really improving that. So why did we go through all those stages? Xamarin Hack Day is run for the community. We run it for you guys, and we just really want to understand where you're at with Xamarin, with app dev. So if you guys can either tweet your stage at me, or sometime during the day, just come up, tap me on the shoulder, and say, I'm at stage two, three, four, that'd be awesome. That way we know where to target our content at. So we'll start off. Apps have got this great trend that's been happening, which says that really, it's more and more and more they're consuming a web resource. Apps, do they just feel like they're part of the internet and it acts as a natural extension? But what we come to realize is that these internet connections that they're consuming in the wild are horribly unreliable. So the solution to that is to use a library called Poly. So what Poly does is it lets us express transient exceptions, handling policies in a fluent manner. Effectively, it lets us put strategies in place, such as retry, retry forever, and circuit breaker patterns, so that when we get these little networking hiccups, our application doesn't fall over. It will respond, degrade state, work itself out, and move on. And how do we do that? Well, this is a common example of a method that will work perfectly in the lab and will cause you a world of hurt in the real world. A simple get the data and deserialize it. Now, if we want to make this method resilient, we can express a policy using FODI, poly. And how policies work is that we work from left to right. So we say, we're going to create a policy to handle an exception, and when the exception occurs, we'll retry the method. And in this case, we're going to retry it three times. And then we come down here and we actually execute upon it. 
So this seems really ham-fisted. Why did we just wrap a policy around an entire method? Does anyone know, looking at this method, why I've gone and wrapped it? HTTP client, when it goes and gets a resource, it just goes off and fetches it. If the resource has actually fallen over or you've got a 500 on your server, it actually says, hey, I, I completed successfully. No exception was thrown. And then you'll get down to your deserialization and your method will still fall over. So you have to be really careful, especially around stuff like HTTP clients, that they're doing the behavior you expect them to do. So what happens if our users don't have any internet connection? And I've actually been caught by this one myself. There are really two ways we get around this problem. One, the application is going to fail, it's going to crash, it's going to fall over and say, sorry, I can't do anything. Please reopen me up when you have Wi-Fi. Which is not a bad strategy. But if we have a look at the really popular apps, such as you know, Facebook, Twitter, and others, they'll at least they'll degrade and say, hey, I can't talk to the internet, but I have the data from your last session. Let me reserve it up to you. So the application retains some level of usability, even though it's in a disconnected state. Now, there are many ways you can do this. And I really like the library Archivash. And really what it is, it's an asynchronous key, persistent key value storage that sits on top of SQLite. And effectively, it just makes handling that persistence to a SQLite database really simple because it, it's written quite well and allows us to write to that database without locking up the UI, without having to really think about it. Now, it's awesome for just caching. So like, hey, I got a web request. I'll go spin an asynchronous thread, throw the results in, keep moving on. It's great for that. But what it's also really good for is storing important data. So you can have a key value pair like user preferences and just store that inside your blob. And it's good to go. So it makes it really simple persisting data. So I kind of recommend if you're going to try this out, you can use it for both stories, the caching and the long-term storage. So how do we use Archivash? First up, we're going to go and we set up a blob name. And then all we do is simply call insert object. We give it the key name, and we say the object we want to insert. And that's all there is to it. By calling this line of code, the UI won't lock up on us. And what will actually happen is it will go spin off in the background, dump it into storage. So that, that way, in this situation where we've got a retry policy, the policy has fallen over, we can actually return back the object we would have cached earlier on. So as we see here, we're able to combine these libraries and make use of them quite effectively. But to, just to write that code, you wouldn't believe how many of these catastrophic errors I ran into. Trying to get your head around all these asynchronous calls, OK, I'm calling off to storage, but I'm also calling off to a web resource. You're going to see something like this regularly, maybe not as colorful. And what can you do? You have two options. Pull your hair out and cry or add something like Fodi Asynchronous Error Handler. So Fodi is an extensible tool, and what it does is it sits in the, the build pipeline, and it waits till it sees a placeholder it recognizes. And as soon as it sees that placeholder, it swaps it over with a predefined block of code. And so one of these extensible tools that are useful for Fodi is called the Async Error Handler, which basically means you place in a placeholder, and it looks for it. And when it sees it, it replaces it with code that means that it will very easily handle any TPL or async errors occurring. So first up, we're going to add the NuGet package. We come up and we set up the Fodi Weaver's XML file. So with Fodi, you're not limited to using one weaver on your project. You can use all the weavers or only one of them. It all depends on what you just set up in this XML file. And then we have to set up a little bit of boilerplate code for Fodi to, when it finds its placeholder, to replace with. So all this code is basically saying, you're saying, when we hit the async error and when I get called, I'm just going to log to the right line the exception. And of course, you can change this if you're using something like Siri log or uh, log for net. With whatever logging tool you're using, it can be swapped out with that debug.write line. And so as we see here, now what's happening is we're going to go and make that call again to data. And OK, the call will fall over somehow. Instead of it actually just dropping the debugger or getting lost in the shuffle, we're going to see in our, our output box, we'll actually see the exception gets printed. This one line of code will save you so much pain and suffering because the way the debugger works, it gets very easily confused by async and finds it really hard to actually 
serve up those errors nicely. So by putting something like in like this, we'll be able to actually see the errors when they happen. Now, if you're using, back to our earlier example, if you're using FODI, you will need to refrow the error. Otherwise, you're going to swallow the exception, and you won't get the retry policies nicely. So as I said earlier, FODI gives you a ton of different options. And these are some other great weavers we can use. So property change will make putting MVVM in a lot simpler. And lastly, there's also crypt string. So when you've got that application you did as a proof of concept, it's probably going to be riddled through a string literals. And sometimes you can decide, well, actually, I don't really want people to be able to go extract those directly out of my source or out of my uh, app package. So you can just drop in a crypt string, which will make it uh, encrypted for you. So in summary, we've covered these three areas. As you see, it's actually really straightforward to make your app nice and robust at the early stages before actually sending it out into the wild. Awesome, thank you. Could we get our next speaker up?